Well, welcome everybody this morning. Thank you for coming uh, to this panel. We'll start right at 11. Um, I think that clock is about 30 seconds slow, but we have a tight schedule today. We have a lot of great presenters who are joining us. Uh, um, I think one of our presenters gets the award for coming uh, the, the greatest distance from Wellington, so thank you for joining us. Really, thank you all. Um, if I uh, had been uh, asked if we ha uh, do not sit in the aisles, please, for purposes of um, uh, building codes and fire officials. So if you could not sit in the aisle, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, let's see. I think we're f largely full, but, but please um, feel free to um, come and go in the back as you see fit. Um, we have a lot of great um, presenters. Uh, for the presenters, please turn off your cell phone so we don't get any uh, uh, disturbance there. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. Decommodification and managed retreat. We will have a variety of law and economics um, driving our discourse uh, this morning. And so I'm very excited to have everybody. Yes. I'm sorry? Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, let's uh, welcome uh, Mike Pappas from the University of Maryland, uh, who's going to get started for us. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me today. And uh, today I'm presenting a project that I'm working on with a colleague, Victor Flatt, from the University of Houston Law Center. Victor's very sorry he can't be here to co-present. Uh, he would want me to say that if you have any criticisms, please direct them to him um, and, and credit to me. Um, and so the goal of the project that we're working on is to apply some property law concepts regarding commodification that are going to give hopefully some theoretically useful and some practically useful contributions to the toolkit of managed retreat. And in particular, here are the two practical things that I, I think we can take away from, and hopefully this presentation will build to that. Uh, first is thinking about commodification concepts, and I will define what we mean by that, can help us frame when we want to trigger managed retreat. And I'm going to use the term we as a catch-all because this framework is agnostic as to who we, who the decision maker is, and we'll come back to that in a second. All right, so one, it can provide a framework for when, man's retreat, and then possibly more importantly, or at least more practically, it can also offer some approaches as to how to accomplish the goals of managed retreat, assuming there are goals, um, and we'll return to that in a second. But now let me talk about what we mean when we talk about commodification. Um, and I do promise to advance from this slide eventually, but not yet. Um, so commodification, as we are considering it, and as the property law literature sort of talks about it, is whether we treat something as a commodity that is freely transferable between willing buyer and willing seller and freely transferable for a whole range of uses, right? So the idea of decommodifying can mean either making something not fully transferable, not transferable at all, even if there is willing buyer and willing seller, or cutting off some uses that are connected typically to property ownership from being transferred, right? And so we're used to talking about limits on property use like land use control, like zoning, like that kind of thing. When we're talking about decommodification, we're talking about something further, right? Uh, certain aspects of control of property being taken away out of the market, either temporarily or permanently, such that the ultimate uses of the property are limited. Okay, so in applying that, what we want to highlight is the long-term management aspects of managed retreat, right, and how property law and policy can contribute to that so that retreat isn't this isolated event of people going somewhere else, but what happens to that land that is retreated from in the long term, 
look at some property tools in terms of planning that. Um, and in terms of how, if we really want to direct that, we might remove it from the market sphere because the market doesn't have any inherent direction. There are outcomes, but not necessarily a direction. So if we want to impose some kind of goal or direction, that may involve some long-term planning in terms of property. Okay, so now um, as we build to that, we'll start in the obvious place, which is sneakers. All right. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the idea of commodification, at least as we're talking about it. So sneakers are a commodity, and these sneakers in particular are the impossible to find Nike X J Crew kill shot. Number two, um, and I want to draw out a couple of things from this slide. This is just a screenshot of an article that was in Esquire. Um, it came out May 7th, 2018, and what it documents for us is this sneaker, which, as it happens, has all the clean lines and easy colors you would want as summer approaches, right? This particular sneaker was incredibly popular, so much so that prior to this article, right, the sneaker was unavailable because it was back ordered. And this article documents it's back, May 7th, it's back, but buy it now because some colors are already back ordered until late August. Okay, so why start here? This is a commodity. I mean, sneakers are as commodified as you can imagine. We have two major retailers participating here. These are sophisticated market participants. And we have a product that's back ordered. And so this highlights that markets take time to adjust. I don't think anyone's arguing that the sneaker market is broken, right? Or that we have incredible market failures here. We have a pretty well functioning market. It takes time to adjust because that's the nature of markets. So if you look at an economic model, right, where eventually markets come into equilibrium because those lines will cross, what that doesn't capture is the time it takes, in this case, four months back order. And so what Victor Flatt and I have done in previous work is identify, is that five minutes down or five minutes left? Five minutes left. Wow, I got to talk fast. I thought I had more than that. Um, what we've identified is markets take time to adjust, and we've labeled that adjustment failure costs. There are costs associated with that time. In this case, your inability to get the easy spring colors that you were looking for in a sneaker, or maybe you're paying more for them in a secondary market on eBay. So this is a picture of a large cat. It's a particular large cat. It's a jaguar, an endangered species throughout its range in the United States. There's a big difference between jaguars and sneakers, right? Jaguars, if we had a market for jaguars, the adjustment failure costs are incredibly high. The time it might take a market to equilibrate for jaguars, if, say, their survival was dependent on it, the cost over that time is incredibly high because back order for Jaguars is extinction, right? So we don't have that as a commodified entity. We don't treat Jaguars as property. And what we suggest in our work is this is descriptive of generally how law and policy treats commodification. When adjustment failure costs are relatively low, we're happy to have things be commodified. When they're relatively high, we don't bear commodification. So how does this apply to managed retreat? Land has been a commodity for a long time. We call it real estate. This is actually coastal property, though you can't tell because there's no evidence of it in the picture, right? We might think of this, a map you may have seen from the New York Times, and it's not just flood, it's all kinds of disaster costs, as a map of how there are different adjustment failure costs for land across the United States, right? So the cost of the market coming into equilibrium as risks get incorporated into the cost or value of real estate might be different in different places. It costs more for markets to adjust in these areas, right? Bearing that in mind, here's how this commodification framework might inform managed retreat. One way of looking at it is when to institute managed retreat. When we can identify adjustment failure costs as being too high, right? This is gonna give us a justification for preempting 
market dynamics for intervention. And then again, maybe more practically, how to do it. If we want to serve continuing goals other than the outcomes, unpredictable outcomes of a market or sequential long-term losses from markets, right, then we may want to use tools of commodification for managed retreat planning. And this also allows us to tap into experience with decommodification in other contexts. Certain cultural patrimony is decommodified, right? National parks are decommodified. Um, trust property, long-term trust, is in some ways decommodified. So it allows us to tap into existing management strategies. So this allows for some choices, and I mentioned before, we're agnostic to a number of these choices, but I want to point out that when we think in terms of decommodification, it allows for some planning choices in terms of when, who decides to decommodify. It could be at the individual level, it could be at the community level, it could be at the government level, and if we opt for the philosopher king, I don't want that. If we do, the philosopher king could decide that as well. And this allows for a pluralist approach to how. Are we going to calculate these adjustment costs? What's going to be included? How much subjective value, et cetera? But it gives a framework for trading off costs and benefits in a way that's a little less ad hoc. Going forward, how to impose decommodification. One way is to structure it into a buyback program or a disaster relief program, right? If this program takes effect, then this property is going to be in some way decommodified. What does that mean to be de decommodified in some way? It could be permanent, it could be temporary. It could be treated like a national park. It could be treated like some kind of temporary limitation on the ability to sell or the ability to engage in permanent structural change or permanent, uh, relatively permanent habitation, right? We could look at the extent, what level of use is going to be allowed, and we could look at how is it going to be enforced? How do we prevent spillovers? How do we prevent recommodification? And so just in the final seconds, this is a picture of Houston during Hurricane Harvey, 2018, right after, and a question going forward is, if we think about this in terms of managed retreat, what do the adjustment failure costs look like here in this, which used to be underwater, 125 billion in damages, right? But now, according to the Houston Chronicle, 13.5 billion in potential development, right? There's already been 10 million in buyouts there. And so, if there's this risk of sequential, high, and regressive going down uh, economic opportunity levels, adjustment failure costs, might we go from the model of now, the areas that flooded have largely been bought out, maybe disaster capitalism, put up for rent to something, and please note my manipulation of the graphic because I'm rather proud of it, um, <laughs> right, to something where we're going to think about this property fundamentally differently. Thank you very much. Uh, while we switch the slides very quickly, uh, does anybody have one question? One question. Yes. In uh, Texas, like Florida, everything is property tax based. And so I think the struggle in Houston uh, is that they have this enormous glut of these older buildings uh, in Harris County, the 40, 50,000 of them. And all these uh, rental companies have come in and bought them up, not understanding that the flood insurance is increasing on them. And so they paid too much for them. They're going to run them to death with renting them out for 10 years until the insurance equals the cost of the building, and then the city's going to inherit 40,000 or 30,000 uh, worthless buildings, and they're going to close schools and fire policemen and have no road maintenance. So it's a, it's a huge, huge issue. Thank you for that introduction into my uh, <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, now for uh, Professor Linda Shi, one of my favorite cited authors, and uh, talking about one of my favorite subjects, land use. So welcome and thank you. So just a few years ago, I would not have imagined being on a panel about real estate and economic development. But this research is motivated by the fact that as we see a number of cities beginning to plan for adaptation, becoming adaptation leaders, doing all the vulnerability assessments that we say they need to be doing, 
If you dig down deep into any of these cities, as uh, Joel Adijabade showed yesterday, whether it's in Lagos or Manila, they're doing adaptation planning, and at the same time, at the same time, they are doing land reclamation on the coast. In Florida, you've got the great, well-touted Southeast Florida comp Climate Compact, and all the purple, blue, and green buildings are either recently completed, planned, or under construction buildings in Southeast Florida. In Boston, almost all of these municipalities that you see outlined in gray have done vulnerability assessments, adaptation plans, and they have in their same uh, development proposals cited all of the major new development in the region on waterfront regions that they know are currently in the floodplain and will certainly be under chronically inundated with six feet of sea level rise. So why is it that we seem to know better and then continue to do more bad? Why do we keep losing even more? And Ciders yesterday from, the, from Harvard was talking about, we urgently need to stop making the situation worse. Why are we still in this process? Um, and so I think that if we are thinking about from the perspective of a municipality acting as a planner, what is it that the planner, the um, counselor, the mayor is thinking about? They have to manage a municipality which has a budget. And I don't want to underestimate the importance of um, growth coalitions, about corruption, about why it is that uh, growth elites, including elected officials, are pro-growth. But the reality is that municipalities in much of the world including internationally, are very dependent on property taxes. And under a fiscal austerity, which is what we've been experiencing for 30, 40, 50 years, where you have declining federal transfers to states, decreasing state transfers to municipalities, um, cities have to increasingly rely on property taxes. And with any kind of property tax cap that states implement, whether that's Prop 13 or Prop 2 and a half, the more it is important then that municipalities need to grow the base or grow the, um, the unit value, which is gentrification of their property in order to make the um, services that you want in any place pencil out. So in the U.S., 30 percent of municipalities on average re rely on, uh, sorry, uh, municipalities on average in the United States um, depend 30 percent of their budgets come from taxes. Uh, in Massachusetts, that's 40 percent. In coastal Massachusetts, that's 60 percent. And in the municipalities I'm going to talk about today, that's 70 to 80 percent. Especially true for residential municipalities where this is their primary tax base. So we did a study. I mean, I think it's interesting that with all the vulnerability assessments that we've done, social vulnerability, damages, physical vulnerability, we haven't brought it back to the unit actor we care about here is governments, local governments. We keep saying cities are supposed to be the ones making a change. What is the impact of fiscal um, to their fiscal tax budget? And I want to recognize that um, Union of Concerned Scientists came out last year with a big study for the national government on this, um, and I'll reference their data later, although in this particular analysis we have different methods and happy to talk in Q&A about that. But this data comes from municipal uh, government and land values in Massachusetts, and what you can see is that as a percentage of total revenues, sea level rise at six feet could threaten up to 10, in the darkest colors, 10 to 25 percent of total budgets. Uh, if it's a percentage of the tax levy, which is the own source revenues that municipalities control, irrespective of federal and state policy, it's even higher, going up to as high as 20 to 43 percent in the darkest colors. But what we also see here is that it's very uneven. There are some places, many places, for even at six feet of sea level rise, it's very low impact. And they're going to do f fine in terms of climate impacts to their, their picture, right? So. Left unaddressed, what we're um, seeing, uh, sorry, uh, what we're seeing right now in terms of the advocacy of what we should do, um, here's the UCS report, is that most of the financing options for cities continue to rely on them growing. Bonds, you have to pay back bonds. Property taxes, you have to have property tax people there to pay those. Resilience fees, that depends on new people coming in. So all of these things kind of re require growth to either stay or to expand in the future to pay, pay this back. Or we're talking about market instruments to align risk to inform property buyers that this is going to be at risk to inform developers so that they don't come. That changes the picture for people leaving or coming back, but in a way it would accelerate the dire fiscal picture for municipalities, which is that any change to their property tax base is going to affect their ability to provide the services. But most, most of that service is being schools, water, 
sewers, roads, and any decline in their ability to provide those services will simply exacerbate that cycle, driving more people to leave and the impoverishment of those municipalities. So within this kind of framework, it is actually very logical that what you're seeing cities do is they are continuing to build in the very last spaces, the post-industrial post -industrial waterfronts, any of this waterfront that they have, build it more resilient, get more growth, get more taxable dollars to service the needs that they have today to provide the things that we say we want, affordable housing, open space, any of that stuff. That means those places that are relatively underdeveloped, low-income communities, lower value, uh, economic value communities are going to become more of interest to gentrifiers. And sometimes the municipalities will want that because they get rid of low-income communities that they nef never, never really wanted to cater to, perhaps. They get wealthier landowners. They get more property taxes. And in places that are not of interest to urbanization or to development, you're going to see more foreclosures. And what does that mean for municipalities? So I want to say that, you know, it's not a necessarily about the moral imperative or the leadership qualities of our cities that are driving them to keep developing in low-lying uh, low places. This is how our structure of fiscal policy and land use policy in this country drives all of our municipalities to make these very rational choices. And if we want to do something different, we need to do something different. So. <laughs> what do we do? Um, this is where, as a, a teacher, um, and I'm sorry, Jesse, I thought I had 15 minutes. I'm just going to let you know I'm not even looking <laughs> over there. <laughs> um, I, will do, I will do my best to, to talk quickly. Um, so what do we do? Um, I also face a struggle that a lot of our scenario planning was a pretty narrow bandwidth and that did not include things like retreat um, or even accommodation. So in this workshop class, we worked with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, which is the COG for Metro Boston. And we had a class and we worked with three towns that Caitlin Spence yesterday pr presented very eloquently how this whole spring they've been doing a vulnerability assessment, social vulnerability assessment with this uh, town of Hall, which you see here. It's a peninsula that juts into the ocean. Um, and there, in, despite the very clear data they presented, they showed how none of the people locally were talking about managed retreat. And so simultaneous to that process, we engaged the, uh, town, plan uh, the town manager of Hull as well as the planning directors of two adjoining municipalities, Hingham and Cohasset, to think about what might be the alternative scenarios. And you can see them here. Here's Boston in the distance, Hull as this stretch of land going here, and very wealthy communities adjoining them. So Hull historically was a Native American hunting and fishing grounds. When settlers came here, it was continued to be a fishing uh, grounds. Slowly it became the pleasure grounds of vacationers from Boston. It has the largest beach for Metro Boston. And over time, as the housing market um, accelerated in Boston and heated up, this became more permanent housing. Um, and it is, um, for the recent decades, mostly working class, blue collar, 96% white, average household income, $75,000. So a bit wealthier, but not super wealthy, but that's changing as more professionals start to buy up this cheaper housing uh, close to Boston. Their values are they want to raise families. They want to be able to age in place and grow old here. They want to have high services in schools. They want affordable housing that they can stay in. They want to be somewhere where they can see and feel the beauty of nature. They want a strong sense of community. You get this from the planning documents. These are the values that people have. And so our challenge was what adaptation futures could provide the things that people are looking for here? Um, so, and this is the reality. This is from the UCS data. If you look at inundation, chronic inundation twice a month underwater by 2100 is most of this place. And so our valuation, it doesn't, you know, if you're in gray on high land, we still count that as viable. In reality, if you can't access it, it's even less viable. So we did a whole uh, process of uh, analyzing a bunch of different kinds of data, geographical, GIS, fiscal, budgets, planning documents. Here's the town manager talking with one of our students. We did tours. And then we looked at what are the different possible scenarios moving forward. Well, the base one is do nothing. Um, and by 2100, this would be the kind of impact to the budgets potentially and the impacts to the services of these municipalities. And that's not a picture that you want to have. What if we build a giant wall? 
this has been proposed for Boston, and they have found UMass Boston said this is not feasible at the moment. So, okay, that's out. What if we do local protection, uh, seawalls of different kinds? And Massachusetts is no longer permitting seawalls. Um, and sand dunes at six feet, how much can a sand dune protect? Also, you've got groundwater pushing up, so your roads and all your infrastructure is sitting in the water. So then we focus on three different scenarios, and these are to elevate. We quantified, and I'm sorry, I don't have time to show the quantification the students did, which is an excellent piece of work. One of the students is here in the back, Audrey Walks. So they quantified this Audrey scenario, um, elevate all the houses and the roads, protect all the sea, sea uh, infrastructure, nourish the beaches. This is what residents may want, right? This is what they may want. We want to stay here. What if we retrenched, we bought out, we retreated from the coast, we densified, we built towers within the remaining land, or we move to other towns? What then? What, what's the cost and benefits? And what if we bought those flooded communities out, or we bought the entire town out and made this part of a new park. Siders yesterday said, talk, you know, what if we have a new national seashore that's public amenities elsewhere? And you can think as planners, this is the ideal solution, move people out of harm's way, let's have a beautiful national park. Um, and our, the data is this why this is so challenging. So if we build a wall, you get everything to keep the same. but there's no funding necessarily. And maybe Boston, they're big enough, they're gonna get that funding. Most places up and down the coast, New York Times just reported, we're not gonna have funding to pay everybody to have a seawall. What if we elevated? If you have you know, three to $600 depend, uh, million dollars, depending on your um, discount rates, but $600 million without discounting is what you would be spending to elevate everything and not including your electricity and your water pipelines to get to basically ground zero in 2100 because then you have another batch to elevate here. And even though people may want this because they think they can stay in place, um, actually because of the increasing costs, only wealthier homeowners are going to be able to afford this. And so the people who right now want to stay, they are going to be financially displaced even though this strategy seems like you can stay. And is this how we want to spend our money? Um, if we want to retreat, um, if you're retreating to other places, you can actually add to the net revenue of the region. But if you've lost half the people in your town, you still have to provide those services, um, but with half the budgets. What municipality is going to do that? It's not just about the buyouts, it's about leaving the schools and the services behind. But if you're talking about buying out the whole place, we're talking about $2 billion to buy it out and restore this. Um, and much less, this is not legal right now. We don't have the funding for it. Um, this is, it is very, very difficult to get at this kind of an ideal future. So I come back to this, you know, we don't want regional inequality, the creation of new enclaves, the creation of new climate slums, but what do we do to get there? So in the U.S., in our fragmented governance structure, perhaps one way is to get towards more regional planning, regional analysis to show these dynamics, but really about regional governance to then implement where you're going to ask other municipalities to change their land use practices to accommodate this. You're going to ask the regions to pay for this. We don't have the structures to do that right now. But this is also a really hopeful opportunity because the same kind of fragmentation and municipal barriers were put up to enforce segregation, to enforce exclusion. And are there ways of rethinking the drawing of these boundaries that would actually also address greater social inclusion and integration here? We have to fundamentally think about fiscal policy that is driving the fiscalization of land use and the reliance on property taxes. And again, not thinking about the um, elites here, but if municipalities didn't stand to benefit whether they built up or not, do we get the same dynamic? I'm not sure that we would. And finally, we may think about decommodification very differently, but this is all predicated on the fiscalization of property. And if we, we've had so many indigenous conversations here, thinking about differently about what we val how we value property, how we de decolonize our governance structures that comes with the decommodification of land as a base property value. So looking forward to our discussion. Uh, as we make the transition, does anybody have a, a question? A single question. Yep, yep, please, please. 
Um, one of the things that we're looking at is this very question of where the money comes from, and and I think that your your argument sort of suggests that as broad a base of funding as possible is perhaps the best way to equitably provide funding sources to do any number of things in the coastal zone. Um, so I'm wondering if you can maybe respond to that, whether that's sort of right from your experience, but also um, what what do we mean by changing our fiscal, fiscal structure and, and where would it come from if not property taxes? Th those are really great questions and I don't profess to have answers to those kinds of questions and in some ways this is a provocation to get many, many smart people thinking about those exact questions. Um, I don't know. I, I actually don't know. Um, but yes, having broader bases, and it's not just about taxing industry, because if you want to tax the big corporations, you require the corporations to be around to tax. So it's a real fundamental question that if we're talking about decolonizing, like what does that mean? Decommodifying, what does that mean? And I think that's a really big space for discussion. Great, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Tedesco. Uh, joins us here from Lamont. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. I'll, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I, this is what you're going to see is what happens when you take a polar scientist like me who spends part of his time camping on the ice and studying the melting of the ice sheets, becoming interested in these topics. And I started this collaboration about two years ago with people like uh, Richard Moss, who's sitting here, uh, Jeffrey Hill in the School of Economics. Uh, and uh, people from the First Street Foundation, which is a, a, a foundation here in Brooklyn, who provided the data that I'm going to tell to you. Um, the original title, of course, uh, was pretentious. Uh, I'm going to show you some in re results that I think are very interesting, but we're going to move towards something that it's uh, uh, heavily applied, but I hope is going to stir up a lot of conversation, and uh, I'll be around most of the day to, um, you know, if you guys want to talk about it. Um, I'm going to focus on Hurricane Florence. Uh, I, I, most of you know the details, of course. I just wanted to remind there was about 40, $24 billion in, uh, in estimated damage and uh, about, about 50, 54 um, uh, fatalities. And uh, um, I really like, to be honest, uh, one thing, that the aspect of the, the gentleman carry on the woman. I think it, it really exemplifies a lot the situations that uh, could occur and will occur, and it's, it's extremely powerful as a, as a message. So the outline is really, uh, I'm wondering what are the tools that we can use to capture what is the maximum flood extent, right? So we want to really capture that, the maximum flood extent. We want to know how far the water reached, which properties were uh, attached, and uh, how do we do that? Do we have the tools nowadays after many years? And I'm personally, I started as a remote sensing person. I've been looking at, for liquid water into snowpacks in, uh, in Canada, into ice in Greenland, so I, I decided why not look into water standing on the Carolinas. Um, then uh, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, potential impact of property values by Florence. And then I'm going to move back and doing some sort of a time series analysis that I think is extremely powerful and I hope you'll find it interesting. So uh, there is a very powerful tool to look at flaws data now, and it's Sentinel radar data. The European Space Agency uh, has launched a, a two sensors, or basically twin sensors, they are radar, they can see through clouds, uh, they can help us mapping the, uh, the flood when it happens, and ESA has a very strongly uh, targeted program trying to, uh, to focus on extreme events when they occur. Uh, one aspect you see here, for example, is, uh, um, I like to use this if it works. Yeah, one, one thing that you see here is really this is the water that was detected by the Sentinel radar data, and this is the, one of the images from the uh, NIP doing Florence. You can really see there is a very good matching. Of course, there are uh, problems and issues, but the radar data is really the most powerful currently, the most powerful sensor to provide observational data uh, during the, the flood events, and especially because if you think about it, you can have optical data, but uh, there's so many clouds that you don't see through things. Um, so, uh, the one aspect that um, we looked at is also how uh, can we capture the maximum flow extent. What you see there here, it's basically this is a time series of a high emitters from a, from a gauge, and, and the two vertical lines are the acquisition time of the radar. So, as you can see, we clearly missed 
the, uh, the maximum uh, flood and maximum high point. And this is another point here where actually um, the peak here is on September 14th, but this is, the, uh, is actually a river gauge where the peak occurred on the 19th. And uh, I will show you that, uh, I can tell you right now, that some of the tools that FEMA uses, of course, were able to capture this peak, but they did not capture this. So I can see a strong complementary uh, information between the FEMA maps and uh, what radar is telling us. Uh, and so we look at uh, the FEMA maximum water extent. It's a very simple and still uh, elegant technique. Um, uh, they take all the tide gauges and river gauge data. They do interpolation. They use a hydrodynamic model, and they come out with, uh, with basically what's estimated to be the maximum flood extent. Uh, you can download it as a shape file or GDB file, uh, and then put it on your uh, on GIS software and try to do some analysis, right? So uh, this is how things look like when you combine the FEMA maps and the radar data. The blue is what the radar sees, uh, the red is what FEMA sees, and uh, on the right, on the top left, those are the footprint of your satellite data collecting your uh, Im images during and before the data. Just to let you know, the radar data is available from 14th to the 19th, and uh, you can see that in some regions, FEMA, is especially in these areas here, is not projecting any extent. And the reason is because those are mostly rural and agricultural areas. Uh, so the FEMA map is also based on uh, uh, watermarks, so people go there and they collect data on where the water height was, so they put everything into this uh, hazardous model and they come out with the, uh, with the extent. So in case you don't have data of uh, water height or somebody wasn't there or the water didn't leave any mark, uh, like for example agricultural fields, you cannot uh, have the kind of information and that's where we're missing. So the results you're going to see are going to be, uh, they're being obtained by combining these two uh, information, try to maximize the, uh, the benefit of using the two, uh, the two sensors. So this is how, uh, and this is what I got from, and uh, this is to me as a, as a climate scientist and polar scientist who go there and collect his own data, uh, I was very, I'm very puzzled about the, all the um, misconception, misinformation, and, uh, and uh, lack of availability of property value data. So if I have to give a shout out here, it's probably let's work together uh, to um, make it more available, especially publicly. And, uh, um, and those companies who work commercially on this, uh, I think there's a lot of room for them to still make profit, which is okay, but uh, also work together to make the data more available, which I think is a basic principle for uh, a scientific democratic decision, which is what we're looking for. So I also overlaid the footprint of the hurricane, just to give you an idea of how many properties were along the, the, uh, the bullseye when uh, the Hurricane Florence arrived. And this is telling you the number of properties here along the y-axis versus how much uh, they value. And, and this is a very nice uh, norm uh, normal distribution. Uh, no, it's, I'm sorry. It's a, a power law distribution, and uh, it reflects the way things evolve in an almost natural way. And uh, um, you'll see that there is a, a reason why I'm showing this. So now the good thing about the data set that I inherited is that they do have also stored the year when the property was built, which to me sounds even more interesting than the value itself. So this is how the uh, affected area was looking like uh, between 1800 and 1900. There's nothing to be, uh, to be surprised. This is how things expanded between 1900 and 1950. You're ready. World War II is over. Boom. So 1950-2000, there's a huge expansion with really no uh, specific uh, direction. Um, if you zoom in, actually, you can really, it's very funny, you can match the expansion of the cities with the lights that the satellite at night, they give you. It's, uh, it's a very powerful tool. And this is what happens, um, sorry, is this, okay, maybe. And uh, am I getting a bonus? Okay, and uh, I don't know what happened, but. Okay, and this is what happened between 2000 and 2018. Now, you might say the time series is much shorter, so you have less buildings, less properties. Uh, I'll come back to this in a second. Now, uh, I think the file it might be too heavy for. Her. So, one thing that uh, actually we find out is that. Despite, I'm going to give you the breaking news before, okay. 
Da war der mal dumm. Hm? Okay, so uh, this is just to give you an idea also the distribution of uh, properties over uh, Mural Beach where uh, Hurricane Florence arrived between 1800 and 1900, the next 50 and 50 years and then 2000, 2018. The dark blue is the permanent water bodies and the light blue is the inundated areas by, from our maps. And you see clearly that there is a lot of development that was actually built over the recent years uh, before Florence uh, hit uh, on the areas that were being uh, flooded. Now, uh, this is one of the most important slides of the presentation. So what I did, you take the property values and uh, you assume what will happen if Florence would have occurred in 1900, 1920, 1930, and so on. So in the blue area, what really I wanted to see in those two minutes I got left, is the property value expressed in billions of dollars of what is the exposed value, property value to the uh, flooded uh, by Florence. And we go from about a value of about $10 billion. It started in the 40s. It goes up, uh, up to about $52 billion. This represents about 11% of the total value of the properties in our database, which is about $450 billion. Now, of course, this is uh, related to the new buildings and the constructions. Um, uh, and uh, you see here on the top right, uh, this is the number of properties built along the different decades. You see there is an incredibly exponential feed. R squared is about 0 0.98. Uh, and then uh, there is a halt here uh, around uh, 2010. I assume the, uh, property, the house market collapse basically had a, play, a large role, and uh, you have a strong drop between uh, 2010 and 2018, which goes back to the same levels about in the uh, pre-war, pre-World War II uh, in terms of number of buildings. Still, building less doesn't mean less exposure. And why? If you look at this plot, this tells you the uh, total property values as a distance from the ocean in this case, but things don't change if you capture the, just the distance from permanent water bodies in general. And you can see for the different periods, which are the different curves, there is a, a threshold value of about 1,000 meters, 1,500 meters, above which there is no impact anymore. And Florence, actually the uh, house values impacted by Florence, they were up to 10 kilometers from the closest permanent body waters. And this is also driven strongly by the hard rains that were falling uh, after, uh, after the, uh, uh, the heat of the hurricane. But what you see really interesting here is this line, which is the property value between 2010 and 2018. Even after you cross that value, you see that the property value exposed continues to increase even when you reach out those thresholds. What does it mean? Basically, in, in simple terms, this implies that even though there were less buildings, less properties built between the 2010 and 2018 period, they were all built in proximity of waters and, and permanent body water that made them exposure much higher than the buildings, that, the, the properties that were there before. So bottom line, um, radar space bordena, it is actually very helpful to, to capture the extent of water. We cannot capture the maximum water extent, but there are, this is the only observational tool that will allow us to build a data set that can be used either through machine learning, uh, combination with FEMA products, to actually build where the flood areas occurred. Uh, there was a total of about $54 billion value of uh, property exposed during Florence, and this value increased from about $10 billion in the mid-40s because of new properties built around the years. Um, and also the uh, slowdown of properties after the house crisis in 2008, it really did not help to make the exposure of these properties uh, a less, a, a smaller issue because they were all built nearby the uh, body waters and this made them actually more vulnerable to, uh, to the flood. Uh, I'm happy to learn more from you. I hope this is gonna be helpful. Thank you so much for having me and thank you, Jess. Again, as we make the transition, we have uh, uh, one question to lead us off. One question. Yes, please.
Great. Thank you very much, and please welcome uh, Professor Orton. Thanks for the invitation to your session. Uh, so this is another presentation that uses some uh, um, evaluation of damages from flooding, so one thing in common. Uh, I also have the observation we need better data. Even in New York City, it's hard to get the good enough data to, on home values um, and depth damage functions to do good computations. Uh, so. Uh, my collaborator, uh, second collaborator is an economist. Um, I'm, I'm a, more of an a ocean scientist, physical oceanographer. Um, but Craig Bond is at Rand Corporation, and, and he's, he's the economist on the study. This is funded by NOAA. Um, and, and the title is Modeling Urban Shoreline Protection Versus Retreat Across Ecosystem Services and Monetary and Human Risk. I'll only speak briefly about the human risk part, um, but I'll summarize a presentation yesterday that went into that topic. So the motivation is that natural capital and ecosystem services that it provides has traditionally been undervalued in the coastal zone. Benefit cost analysis can include valuation of a range of ecosystem services, but typically it's limited to storm damage reduction. And that's definitely the case with the Corps of Engineers, who struggles to include co-benefits uh, other than storm damage reduction. In, and uh, in the New York City area, New York, New Jersey area, after Hurricane Sandy, there's been a huge movement toward um, and a lot of demand for flood mitigation since Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and one thing that seems to be winning out is cross-estuary storm surge barriers, such as was the case with Boston in the earlier presentation. That's being studied there. It actually didn't win out there in an academic study. Um, but in New York City, uh, for Jamaica Bay, New York, that's uh, one, the one uh, chosen in, in a draft study by the Corps of Engineers, a storm surge barrier across the inlet was chosen as the best, cost, most cost-effective solution for flooding. Um, Retreat was eliminated in that study and now also uh, in a follow-up study um, that's looking at the whole region. So the Jamaica Bay study, actually sort of the storm surge barrier solution got punted to a much larger scale regional study. So it still isn't planned to be built or funded, um, but it, it was initially the preferred choice there. In this harbor and tributary study, regional for New Jersey, New York Harbor area, um, retreat was eliminated early on also, or it's not being studied yet, and they say that it may be studied in the next phase. Um, the goal of, of our work is to explore and improve methods for incorporating non-protective ecosystem service values into these benefit cost analyses, um, hope, hoping for an, a wider use uh, in decision making, such as by the core. Uh, just to summarize yesterday's mortality um, risk reduction paper, it, it's very relevant for um, the study of retreat. Um, it was an idealized modeling study. Uh, it's, it's a chapter in a dissertation by Feng Lin Zhang, my PhD student. Um, and, and one of the interesting conclusions uh, was just that uh, studying retreat from monthly tidal flooding, which we quantify with the hydrodynamic modeling, we, we see uh, in an idealized landscape with a small neighborhood and then high ground, people retreating to high ground, uh, that is a better scenario for, it's about similar amount of risk reduction to having a berm that blocks the flooding entire, up to a certain return period of flood. Um, and in the long run, the berm just, uh, it's not, if it's not raised continually with sea level rise, then it becomes, it becomes less, cost, less of a solution for mortality risk. Whereas retreat, if it's dynamically occurring in response to increased monthly tidal flooding, then that has a long-term benefit that continues if you have that program in place. So those, that hasn't been applied yet. It's, it's in draft form with this uh, today's study that I'm going to show, the mortality risk component. Um, so I won't talk about that more in this presentation. An overview of today's presentation, we're developing methods for bioeconomic valuation of natural and nature-based features in their ecosystem services and applying these to a suite of flood adaptation scenarios from other studies for Jamaica Bay, New York City. Um, I'm only going to show a few of those scenarios today that make my main points, but um, we've also applied it to other scenarios, about six uh, to eight in total. Um, we apply simple value transfer methods from other studies, and then we also use modeling to have a deeper dive into a few ecosystem services that we uh, know are of a high, high value in an urban um, setting like New York City. And these are flood mitigation and hypoxia mitigation. And then uh, a work in progress that I won't talk about today is, today I'm just going to look at 20, the present day and 50 years from now. I'm not going to do the full um, benefit cost analysis or integrating over time into the future, so I'm not going to get into cost, but we're just going to look at benefits today and in 2065. 
So the adaptation scenarios I'll show today come from a study that we called in short integrated modeling because it included dynamic modeling of land cover change such as wetland response to sea level rise. Um, we look at a 50 year uh, time frame out to 2066. Um, this, the two cases from this study were a control creature without action also um, and then two adaptation concepts which I'll show next. It was a very participatory climate adaptation study. Um, so the first one is this uh, tentatively selected plan from the draft core report that I mentioned, which includes a storm surge barrier as its, as its main component for protection or, or flood risk reduction, and, and also levee systems out to Coney Island and around, uh, around Rockaway Peninsula, which aren't shown in this map. And then there were also res restoration features. That's something the core commonly does. It's not including ecosystem service benefit in making the decision here, but it does sprinkle them on top of the flood risk reduction plan that comes from gray solutions like surge barriers or levees. And then the ad we, we uh, in this um, collaborative study with communities and with, with New York City government, we also came up with this nature-based alternative um, for consideration, which included restoring the wetlands of the bay to a 1974 footprint and also restoring a narrower inlet, which existed in the 1800s. Um, and this, has, this reduces flooding somewhat, but isn't a complete, you know, uh, nothing like the protection of the surge barrier, and it also improves water quality. So it has multiple benefits, in addition to the wetlands being of high value uh, in an urban landscape. Um, and so the managed retreat scenario uh, also I'll, I'll look at. It's retreat from monthly tidal flooding if you have high-end sea level rise, in this case, at 2066. So, um, but one challenge is that there's polluted, that we've learned about Jamaica Bay and New York City is there's contaminated soils in all these landfill areas. So these areas that uh, require managed retreat in the red dots and basically all the fringing areas, including JFK Airport here, are built on top of former open water or wetlands. And so they're very low lying um, and the landfill is contaminated. So it's not so easy to say, you know, let's have retreat and restore. Um, and so, so it's, a, it's a big challenge for, for urban landscapes. Uh, we look at a 50 year climate change scenario, uh, which is used for the flood risk, the wetland, the wetland migration and hypoxia modeling. And that's based on uh, work from New York City, City Panel on Climate Change, um, in particular Radley Horton's work. And I'll just keep moving quickly since I have less time than I expected. Um, ecosystem, uh, so one thing I'm not talking about today is Vision Maker. This is all in this biome based, like land cover based ecosystem service valuation is being embedded into a online tool called Vision Maker. Um, and so that's what VM is. So we're incorporating it into Vision Maker so people can, we can crowdsource people having their own adaptation designs. Um, and, we, and we use that um, with this biome based approach, um, the simplistic approach shown here. So for example, a beach, an acre of beach is worth $42,000. This is based on a, paper, a study that looked at New Jersey. So an advantage is it, it's easy to understand. It's just based on land cover. Um, and it addresses the typical ecosystems in this region, such as be beach, uh, inland wetlands, coastal wetlands, et cetera. Um, and, and so it's based on worldwide data. This is what value transfer is. You take many studies worldwide, and we get an uncertainty and a, and a central estimate of the value for each biome. Then deep, for the deeper dive, we're looking at service-specific value of flood mitigation um, with hydrodynamic modeling of um, floods. Also, adaptation strategies evaluated uh, using the damage model has it. Um, and then hypoxia mitigation is valued using also uh, three-dimensional dynamic modeling of the water, the estuary. Um, and we use a cost avoidance approach. So if a particular la landscape uh, adaptation choice reduces hypoxia, then we say, well, that can re reduce the need to uh, mitigate hypoxia with gray traditional techniques, such as wastewater treatment or uh, sewer buildout. So it's, it's uh, in economic terms, it's called a cost avoidance approach, and it um, assumes that there's a binding Clean Water Act assumption, although Clean Water Act's a pretty complicated um, topic. Um, and so the HAZUS, going into detail on these, the HAZUS, this is a pretty standard use of HAZUS. We run 10 different um, simulations of storms for each sea level rise scenario in each landscape, uh, each adaptation landscape. We use HAZUS model. We compute an adaptation benefit. Um, some prior papers uh, review those methods shown at the bottom. One thing uh, mentioned on the far right is that uh, we don't actually take it to the summing over going through future years. We're just looking at 2016 and 2016 and 2066. Um, so we're not uh, doing the full benefit cost analysis yet, although we intend to. 
Um, and so the hypoxia mitigation valuation is shown here in its methods. So basically, New York City spends $600 million uh, in the past few decades on reducing nitrogen in wastewater effluent into Jamaica Bay alone. Um, and they spend, they've spent billions of dollars on trying to separate the stormwater and the sanitary sewers. So there's huge expenditures on this, um, on improving water quality in, urban, in an urban context. So this should be valued higher than, than through the biome-based approach, which is from any part of the world. Um, and so we account for this separately. Um, and so uh, based on various additional assumptions, we come up with every 1% reduction you get in hypoxic volume with your adaptation approach is valued at 0.24 million to 3.8 million per year with a central estimate of 2 million. And shown on the bottom right are some actual modeling results of hypoxia. The actual hypoxic uh, volume of or area actually in the bay, um, present day, future without action, where it increases significantly, and then the two adaptation scenarios. Interestingly, the storm surge barrier actually reduces the hypoxia in the bay. I won't get into the details, but it increases, reduces it a little bit. The nature-based approach reduces it even more. Some of these results are surprising. It's why you need to run a dynamic water model to understand some of the, some of the to quantify things. Um, and so the valuation uh, of the land cover and, and the, based on land cover and also based on these two deep dives into hypoxia and flooding is summarized here. <clears throat> on the right shows the land cover map for present day. This is just present day right now. Um, so the values are um, 240 to 261 million with the, the uncertainty range for total values of ecosystem services on the bay. Most of that comes from flood mitigation, but a significant amount from a hypoxia mitigation also and other services. And then here's my final results slide. Uh, so the, it shows concept one, which is the surge barrier, Corps of Engineers tentatively selected plan. Concept two is the nature-based approach. And then the third approach is retreat. You see in terms of the first column, flood mitigation benefit in million dollars per year. There's a huge loss due to climate impacts, so uh, negative benefit. Concept one can counteract that uh, and has a large benefit uh, of reducing flooding. Concept two only partially uh, protects, and so it doesn't uh, not and it doesn't um, account for all the negative change from sea level rise. So it's a smaller number than 97 versus 176 million, per, and these are in per year values. Retreat has a better uh, performance. So it's ranked one for, for the surge barrier, two for retreat, and three for the nature-based adaptation for flood mitigation. But when you look at the other, um, the biome-based and the hypoxia-based um, benefits, you actually change your ordering, your rank ordering, to where concept two, the nature-based, has a higher value. And again, this is because we assume no restoration when you have retreat. So I think we really should also try the opposite assumption that some that they figure that out, they figure out how to deal with contaminated sediments and, and look at the alternative case of actually having restoration. So you can have a switch in the ordering here, but it doesn't change the fundamental conclusion that the surge barrier in this specific case, because of all its flood protection, would be come out best in, a, in 2065 for, for uh, the benefit. So the final conclusions of which I just mentioned, a few of them. Storm protection is on the order of 80% of the total ecosystem value lost to sea level rise. Um, Co-benefit inclusion is not significant to change number one ranking, which is the surge barrier, but it does have the potential to switch the ordering of these different options. Um, Non-protective ecosystem services can be maintained or even improved as you go forward um, relative to climate change impacts. And lastly, coastal retreat, if there's no restoration, it re results in no improvement in non-protection ecosystem service value. And the problem there in an urban landscape is uh, that there's contamination. That's it. Thank you very much. It's a powerful um, body of future research to examine the extent to which ecosystem services are not accounting for the benefits of retreat. Uh, and I think you highlight what we leave behind and, and, and have yet to determine. Uh, do we have one question as we make the transition? Please. Yeah, the uncertainties are a big challenge, and we've sort of been starting to quantify them. Through that Liu et al. paper, there is a range. There's an uncertainty range. Uh, through uh, the storm protection services that we're quantifying in detail, we've, we've come up with ranges in the past, and, and I didn't show them here. Um, 
And so it's definitely, you know, it's a work in progress. The, in the hypoxia mitigation, it's just like, how do I do that? You know, I came up with a range, but it, it's a big challenge also. So I think it's, but to your point, I think it's critical to admit the uncertainty because it's huge. Um, and then if there is a big uncertainty, we can't be too frustrated with that because it's better than saying it's worth zero and not accounting for it at all. So, so that's our philosophy also. All right, thank you very much, Phil. I'd like to welcome now uh, Dr. Rachel Cletus from the Union Concerned Scientists, whose work uh, engaging real estate and climate change has been foundation, foundational for both scholarly uh, ambition and public awareness. So uh, welcome. Jesse, thank you so much for uh, having me on this panel today. I'm going to actually uh, sort of hurry through the analytic portions of my presentation here, just in the interest of time. I'm actually wanted to dwell uh, with this audience on some of the implications of what's at risk uh, from sea level rise. Uh, the work that I'm presenting is a joint project that I did with a number of colleagues at UCS. Uh, we're sort of a mix of expertise. Uh, I'm an economist by training. Uh, some of my climate scientist colleagues uh, uh, collaborated on some of the mapping work. And what we tried to do was recognize the fact that well before places go underwater completely, they will start to get flooded frequently enough that it will lead to real uh, changes in people's daily lives, and it will certainly affect coastal real estate values. So uh, through some published work, we have defined a threshold of 26 times per year or more as a threshold where communities, uh, when they flood at that threshold, uh, will start to see some of these significant changes, and we call that our chronic inundation threshold. Um, so what we did with this work, we've been doing this body of work over a period of years, looking at uh, land at risk, military bases at risk. Uh, we looked at some hotspots that have socioeconomic challenges and also are exposed to sea level rise. And this latest work on the far right here, the underwater work, is looking, uh, taking our chronic inundation methodology and twinning it with property data from Zillow. Zillow was not involved in the anal analysis at all, but uh, they provided the data, the property level data for us. And we basically, our methodology is pretty simple and straightforward. I'm gonna skip through it. We're using tide gauge data, 93 tide gauges in the lower 48 digital elevation models from NOAA, and sea level rise projections from NCA3. Uh, we focus on the high scenario, uh, about 6.6 uh, feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. Uh, although we do present results for an intermediate uh, about uh, four feet of sea level rise and then uh, 1.6 uh, feet of sea level rise by the end of the century that we use as a proxy for a Paris Agreement type scenario uh, that also assumes uh, we have limited land-based ice loss, uh, something that the latest science is showing is um, uh, really unlikely to be the case. Um, so to uh, just skip to the highlights of our results, what we try to do with this work is really bring this into time frames that are salient for policymakers and homeowners. So the 2045 time frame, well, which is kind of the 30-year mortgage time frame, is the one that we try to focus uh, people on to recognize that this risk is near term. We're not talking about end of century. And what we found that uh, is that around the country we have over 300,000 homes uh, that are at risk from sea level rise by 2045. Uh, by 2100, that number jumps to 2.4 million homes. Uh, and you can see that there are places around the country like Florida, uh, New Jersey, New York, California that really pop in terms of the number of homes that are at risk. Um, we also evaluated the amount of property at risk uh, in terms of the dollar value. Um, and here we find that by 2045, we have uh, nearly $118 billion in today's dollar values that is at risk by 2045, and over a trillion dollars by 2100, again, in today's property values. Um, and then, as many folks have pointed out through the course of this conference, it's not just about individual homes, it's also about communities and the local property tax base. Um, so in our results, what we find is that by 2045, we've got nearly 1.5 billion in today's property tax base that's at risk uh, from sea level rise, and that number jumps to 12 billion by 2100. Um, and this is also about people, of course. Uh, there are people who live in these homes. Uh, by 2045, uh, we're talking about 550,000 people today, assuming no population change uh, from today, that are at risk of this uh, chronic flooding. 
um, and that number jumps to 4.7 million uh, by 2100. Again, keeping population constant, and we know that along our coastline, we're actually seeing population and property increase over time. We also looked at the fact that there are many places where there's a confluence of socioeconomic and uh, climate-related challenges. These are maps for Louisiana and uh, Maryland, uh, and the blue dots there show you places that have poverty rates above the national average, scaled by the amount of homes at risk. Louisiana is one of those places where we see a, a really high confluence of these uh, places uh, that have folks uh, who are living in poverty but also exposed to this uh, high risk. What we did with our results is make them available not just in the traditional report, but there's an interactive map that's available online uh, at ucsusa.org slash underwater. And you can go there and explore the data uh, in different time slices for different sea level rise scenarios. Uh, we have state level results. Uh, this is New York State, for example. Uh, we have them available at the community level, which is roughly municipalities, towns, uh, that type of uh, level. And we have it available at the zip code level. Um, we, we do technically have the data at the property level, but uh, chose not to release it for a variety of reasons. Uh, we think the data is not completely accurate at that granular level. And more importantly, it felt um, that we would be putting the bullseye on individual homes uh, and didn't, didn't want to go there. Uh, uh, and, and the other thing that we did is we did look at a sea level rise scenario that is a low scenario, a Paris-like scenario. And what we wanted to point out is we do still have choices. So this, for example, is a, a community, Tom's River in New Jersey. And if we were to stay in a Paris-like scenario with land-based ice loss limited, we could avoid up to 85% of uh, the properties that are exposed to this chronic inundation risk uh, by the end of the century. So one of the key things I want to say is that in our conversations around adaptation, a key lever we have is mitigation. Cutting emissions, making deep cuts in emissions is critical to helping protect people. We have a whole suite of uh, 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 products on our website available. There's the map, of course. Uh, we also created this little handy-dandy brochure for home prospective home buyers. Uh, if you're looking to buy a home or someone you know is looking to buy a home around the coastline to make sure that they're asking uh, the right questions. We also released all this data at a congressional district level. Um, and we did an expert elicitation with some private financial sector actors as a part of this analysis. And that's kind of where I want to dwell. We know we've got to do better communicating these risks and hopefully work like ours and work that others have shared in terms of mapping can help to start do that. We know we've got to stop doing stupid things, as in let's stop putting more people and property at risk. Let's align our policies and market incentives towards better decision making. And finally, we really do have to think about some bold, bold uh, pro uh, policies and the governance structures that we'll need to go with that to make sure that they're equitable. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we've got to do the mitigation and the adaptation piece, all of it, uh, as, as quickly as possible, as much as possible. And we have to be thinking about this. Yes, it's about individual homes that are at risk and those homeowners. It's about the communities that are exposed because of their property tax base and everything that that property tax base funds. It's about banks holding those mortgages, uh, people who invest, uh, real estate uh, developers on the coastline, insurers, realtors, and the taxpayer at large as this, this problem really starts to become real in the financial markets the reverberations could be considerable, especially in some places that are highly exposed. Uh, as part of our expert elicitation process, as I said, we spoke to uh, bankers, uh, credit rating agencies, et cetera, and we asked them a few questions. The number one thing, nobody denied the science. It's real. It's absolutely happening. The risk is material. And yet, most of them agreed that the market is not pricing this accurately. In fact, they all agree the market is not pricing this accurately right now. Here's Andrew Terras from Breckenridge talking about one of the reasons, the mismatch in the time horizons between uh, the way market actors tend to think and the way some of these risks are coming. I would say that this mismatch is collapsing in time right now because actually the risks are real. We're already seeing the flooding in places that have a lot of expensive property. Um, this is uh, from S&P Global Ratings, Kurt Forskin, talking about the need for uniform, transparent disclosure. 
Uh, he says, by governments, obviously we need this risk disclosure by everybody, including private sector actors, so that the risk can be accurately priced uh, in the market. Uh, this is uh, from Doug Puda at Bentle Kennedy. They're a big commercial uh, holdings, uh, commercial property holdings uh, company. And again, saying that the risk is real, it's going to be material for commercial property values. And this is a really long quote from Roger Grenier from AIR. They do catastrophe modeling. Uh, the reason I put it all up there is this, this gives you a little insight into way, the way the private sector is thinking about how this risk might materialize in the market. So everybody said, you know, it's real, and in some places it's, it's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. So what is that thing that is going to make the market shift? And you can see uh, the, the things that we've been talking about here in this conference come up. It's insurance, what happens in the insurance market. It's about are there going to be regulatory changes, including around uh, adaptation and resilience, but also around disclosure perhaps. Um, there, there is uh, S&P and uh, Moody's have both said that they're going to start taking this in, into account in their credit ratings. We haven't actually seen uh, them really derate any particular community around uh, this climate risk. But should that start to become real, that is also a factor. And then finally, the thing that folks have been talking about, is it going to be a, a, a signal event or a series of signal events like major storms coming one after the other? We did actually have a, a series of storms in 2017. That was a pretty uh, devastating year for hurricanes. And yet, the market hasn't shifted. So uh, what, what I, and this is sort of a set of headlines related to our study. I know there have been many studies like this. But I, I just, I guess where I want to leave this is that there is all this information out there. There are all these folks who know that this risk is real and it's coming. And it's almost like there is a, it's some kind of a denial or, or a conspiracy of silence around the implications of what these risks are. It's almost like everyone's afraid of dropping that first domino because then everything starts to go. And I would say the biggest thing holding people back is that we have not given people options. It's not just about property values falling. It's the what happens next that's important. What are the options we're going to give homeowners to get out of there? Where are they going to go? Where are we investing in so that people can see the opportunity, not just the retreat, but where you're going to go? I work in the space of clean energy and climate, and for me, there's a lot of analogies with what we say to coal-dependent communities today. It's not just about you're going to lose your job and this industry is going away. How are we going to help fund transition assistance so that there is a brighter future in those communities? And I think until we make those options concrete through government policy, and I think government has a huge role to play here along the, alongside the private sector, uh, the private sector could be investing in these places, building infrastructure, building new places for people to go to. I think we'll continue to have the sort of uh, – you know, ostrich uh, with a head in the sand kind of approach, and that is deeply, deeply dangerous because in some places, when the market decides to shift, it's going to be devastating for individual homeowners, especially those who are low income, fixed income, elderly folks who have retired, and you know, this this is their single biggest asset. Um, so hopefully, the conversations like we're having here are ones that will unlock this conversation in the wider world. And if we create those options, I think there will be some willingness in people to shift and stop avoiding these realities. Thank you. Uh, uh, a question as we transition, please. Hi, I just wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about the decision not to put the bullseye on individual properties in your risk maps and do it by zip code instead. Um, I, I think I understand maybe individual houses may be too inaccurate, and I appreciate that. But zip code may not be the right sort of uh, districting for that. Maybe a school tax, a school basically districts would be a better way. But I wonder if you could talk a little more about it, because yesterday in the panels on communication of climate change risk, specifically was voiced that once individual granular data is available to homeowners, they, it stimulates the conversation and community um, action. Yeah, I, you know, we had a variety of reasons, uh, as I mentioned. I, to me, also, I think that the, the most important thing to recognize is while this is coming to bear on individual homes, 
the responsibility is a collective, national, even international, frankly, but national responsibility. And oftentimes when you release data on individual homes, people go to this place where it's about that homeowner and what are they going to do? Are they going to leave? Are, are we going to have to keep bailing them out? And actually it's a question of, so how they're there through no choice of their own, right on the front line of this risk. How are we as a nation going to come together to figure out the policies? And what we wanted to do with our data is just show this is happening all around the country. Yes, it's happening to individual homes in particular communities, but it's happening in so many places in the country um, that it's, it's no longer going to be enough to talk about moving individual property owners from where they are. We really have to be talking about this in a more holistic way. So there will be others. Uh, you know, just last week there was an article in the Insurance Journal saying that a consortium of scientists and First Street Foundation are going to be releasing this data at the individual property level. Um, and I think, uh, you know, on one hand, I, I love the idea of the communication of the risk, and my heart sank a bit because I thought, oh, my God, we don't have the policies. People are going to see their homes in the bullseye, and we don't have the policies and the help. So I hope we can do these things together, communicate the risk, but also give people the options about what to do about it. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to welcome an emerging scholar joining us from Victoria University of Wellington, Belinda Story. Thank you for having um, coming. Uh, thank you. And I'm uh, presenting today on behalf of Ilan Noy, who is the Chair of Disaster Economics at uh, Victoria University. Um, uh, we were thinking about our um, climate miles and coming here uh, since I was an alumni of the business, Columbia Business School, I was very quick to put my hand up and offer to go in his place. So um, uh, what I'm presenting here today was inspired by um, Catherine Ratch's uh, 2017 paper that looked at the socio-political um, factors that uh, impede or promote uh, managed retreat. And what we wanted to look at is what is the, from an economic perspective, what are the attributes that will determine where the funding comes from? This isn't about where the funding should come from, but where we anticipate the funding will come from. And in doing that, um, we used a, a case study of one of the largest uh, managed retreat processes in a, a developed country. Um, it's to do with a earthquake risk, but we think that there's some important lessons as far as climate change is concerned. Following the um, Christchurch earthquake in New Zealand in 2017, uh, this happened in February. I happened to be involved, um, present when um, there was an earlier one where there were no fatalities. I was on the 26th floor of a building that subsequently was um, uh, demolished, but um, at the time I, there were no fatalities and we all felt very smug in New Zealand about our building codes. Then in February um, we unfortunately had the tragedy of 185 lives being lost in the Christchurch city. Um, I'll talk about a little bit more detail of that, but in the, the broad concepts um, that we looked at is thinking about whether there is public versus private interest and how, what the probability of the risk is. And what you'll find when, we, when I talk further about this is that how does that change when the risk itself is changing? So in the first quadrant, we can think about a publicly insured risk. So this is something similar to um, the National Flood Insurance Program in the UK. They've currently stepped, recently stepped in with Flood Re to provide insurance in the flooding um, area because private insurers have withdrawn from that. And in New Zealand, um, disaster insurance is provided by the Earthquake um, Commission, but also potentially providing support in storms and floods. Um, quadrant B, where there is um, a very, as the risk becomes much more probable, uh, chances are insurance has all already retreated, but there are public legal obligations and certainly there are um, moral li liabilities, something that we talk about, charity hazard, that there is uh, extremely difficult for uh, public um, officials to deny support to locations where a disaster has occurred. In Quadrant C, we talk about private, insure, um, private risk, um, risk where private, the, it is privately insured. And in Quadrant D is a location where the risk has retreated, so the insurance has retreated, and, the, and there is no, no longer an ability to transfer risk from the um, property owners. So Christchurch City, this is um, the aftermath of, a, of the retreat. 
Um, in the Christchurch earthquake, um, it was exceptionally high in levels of insurance. Because of that, um, we had both public insurance and private insurance. The cost of rebuilding um, Christchurch City was about 26 billion in US dollars. Um, 170,000 homes experienced claims. It was three quarters of the, um, of the entire region's um, residential stock. Um, it, this was an area, the, the probability of risk in this location was, ex, was it expected to be quite low, uh, which is partly why the insurance level was so high. By comparison, um, the overall insurance level in Christchurch was 69%. That included residential, uh, commercial property. When you compare that to the Japan um, uh, 2011 earthquake, the, the level of insurance was only 19%. So New Zealand enjoys very high um, insurance rates. Uh, what happened was 8,000 homes were um, uh, what was called red zoned, about 20,000 individuals. And this is a sample of the, the um, suburb, one of the suburbs that was um, uh, relocated. Uh, you'll notice that it's um, near a water line that wasn't because of flooding. This was because of liquefaction. So for those who aren't familiar with liquefaction, um, the ground gets very squishy and um, uh, buildings can sink into the sand or sink into the soil. The cost of repairing that soil to the uh, standard to be able to put a house back on top of it was so great that the government stepped in and said, this is something that we're going to be seeking this large-scale managed retreat from. Um, an important um, finding that we have from the insurance perspective here is there were a handful of individuals who didn't have insurance there. Uh, my colleague, Alain Noy, has undertaken research, and it's uh, interesting that those who were, had full insurance had the best benefit, uh, economic benefit after um, a period of time. Those who had insurance but ended up fighting with their insurer to get the payout were actually worse off than individuals who had no insurance. Those individuals with no insurance were able to move on, get other jobs, relocate, and they weren't stuck in broken houses. Their economic um, uh, benefits outcomes for them were better than those who had insurance but entered into lengthy uh, disputes with insurers. Um, a comparison is this is a location in the UK in uh, North Wales. Uh, they have a, um, a large proportion of the um, England and Wales coast is fortified uh, this historically. And there's a decision that was made um, to reinforce the uh, coastal defences but there was a recognition at that point that the local council uh, wasn't going to be able to undertake the next level of investment. So they notified the homeowners that they would no longer be defending this. They expected the existing defences to last for a period of time, and they gave notice that they would be looking for a decommissioning of the location. At this stage, there is no compensation that has been provided to any of the individuals here. Insurance has immediately been lost. Um, there has been a drop in property values, but it's not as steep as people anticipated. And for those who attended my talk earlier, it's aligned with the model that we had there. It's about 40% reduction in property values, but people are continuing to live there in the meantime. Um, to give you a point of comparison, the cost of defending this location, which has about 850 residents, uh, would be about $150 million. The cost per resident is, would be about 100 times the cost of defending uh, the average resident in London with the um, Thames barrier. So there is an element of what the per capita cost of the defence is, um, and that and certainly comes into it. So looking at how um, that can play out, in the Christchurch situation, a large proportion of the, um, the relocation costs were covered by private insurers, and that is because we had public insurance which helped bolster the level of penetration in the, in the um, area. We also have uh, an all-perils approach in New Zealand, which I accept is, um, is unusual. Uh, and there was private insurers were then able to um, had high, high penetration when the event occurred, there was a, a collective decision made, in part probably because of the, uh, the trauma of experiencing the number of fatalities. The community came together and accepted that this. Um, the New Zealand government made 
um, uh, instituted uh, immediate changes to laws to, uh, to be able to provide for some of this. But if we look at the case of Fairborn, um, they are currently, uh, the risk is primarily individual, and that is, um, that is, there is an expectation that that will be borne by the individual, borne by those individual homeowners. However, in time, we can expect that because of this expectation of government support of those in a, in a dangerous location, there is likely to become a moral liability to step in. But the point, there will already have been significant losses by those homeowners. You would argue that they've already experienced that 40% loss in value already. Over time, they will experience more, but there may be some demands for compensation when the major event occurs. So I'd like to welcome uh, all of our presenters. Um, to join us up front for a conversation with the balance of our time. Actually, for everybody here, uh, now's a good time to get up and stretch because we've been sitting here for a while. So those who are able, uh, please take the opportunity uh, to get some blood flow because we need to get our brains going uh, for those last 30 minutes. Um, if somebody wants to join me here um, in this spot, because I think we have a pretty, oh, we have a chair here. Oh, we do end at 12.30, not 1 o'clock. Oh, okay, so in the last five minutes. All right, sorry. I have uh, misappropriated time. We've got five minutes. Let's go with Radley in the back for our first question. So, you know, I think for a lot of private sector actors, there's still a sense that their portfolios are, are diversified enough that any individual event is not going to be, uh, you know, catastrophic in that sense. But this is what's starting to change. We're starting to see uh, that hypothetical is not a hypothetical. We had a terrible fire season and a terrible hurricane season, and we're seeing terrible floods right now in the, you know, right through the Midwest and the central part of the country. So once this starts to happen, you, you know, the, the past is not going to be a good predictor of the future. And then you have those entities that are very tied up in local economies. So if you're in the Florida market and you're a regional bank, a small bank, uh, or if you're an insurer who works in a particular jurisdiction like that, uh, this could be a big part of your portfolio. So, uh, and for the taxpayer, we're implicated all over the country. Um, so whether it's through mortgages that are federally backed uh, or it's through firefighting costs, uh, we are implicated, the NFIP. Um, and so I think it's time to do things differently now. The, the, the data is not just data, it's reality at this point. Claude, yep, 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 yep. Real quick, please. Just one second on what uh, Rayleigh said. It's, first of all, I wanted to clarify that the data I showed is 2018 dollars corrected, so there is, it's already corrected for that. I didn't mention that. But uh, about the correlation, it, it's very important what Rayleigh said. For example, forest fires, you mentioned that, even though there is no strong uh, indication about climate change related things, there is a, a causality, for example, fresh snow uh, on the, the season before can help grow new grass that can help to further spread the, the fire. So this kind of correlation and streams, and this work is brilliantly uh, analyzed by Park Williams and Lamont. So this kind of events, and connecting these extremes is extremely important, not only at the short time scale, but also at the multi-seasonal, inter-seasonal scales. That's, that's, I think, one of the aspects I wanted to highlight. Just one word on that. Please, please. And, and just one word kind of to, to where your question went is, uh, absolute risk is probably not as important as perception of 
risk, right, whether correlated or not. Yeah. Klaus. If I, if I could add to that, um, when we think about the societal tolerance of risk, sometimes major events in one part of the world can significantly change policy elsewhere. So the, the most recent example would be the Queen, Greenfield Fire in London that has significantly changed uh, the reviews around building regulations all around the world um, as, far as, as far afield as Australia and New Zealand. Um, and if we think about uh, more close to home, the, the shirt waste fire in New York in the early um, last century, that had a significant impact on regulations. Unfortunately, the tragedy is there tends to need to be a significant loss of life before you get those policy changes, but they do apply well outside the area that it occurs. This is a comment in uh, context of Belinda's um, presentation. It's probably interesting to note that New Zealand is an anomaly in terms of its insurance. It started out of war insurance, where New Zealand decided that if there's any impact of war, World War II, on the population, they would get paid for. And that public consensus then translated into hazards. And here we have only national flood insurance, which wasn't really to protect the homeowners. It was trying to protect the banks for mortgages. We have separate fire insurance and other things on. So it's this mentality is entirely different and it shows the influence of government on the economic impacts. Question. In insurance, Greg. Sorry, so Jonathan, the yeah. question is, what can we do in terms of policy proposals to change our mentality here in this country in the insurance context? Anybody? Any uh, low-hanging fruit? Mike, please. So by all the predictions I've seen, we are going to continue living in the same world with the same people. Um, <laughs> under conditions of climate change. Uh, and, and so I think the idea of macro change to mentality might be the high-hanging fruit, right? And, and how can we work within what's more likely is low-hanging? I know that's, that's not a satisfying response, but I, to me it is. Well, I think that there's some debate as to thresholds and, and perhaps – uh, more precisely, tipping points in valuation within asset classes where you could see a rapid devaluation. Um, I mean, that's some of the conventional thinking, at least in the property market. So it's somewhat debatable question. Please, please, please. Yes. Um, so, Rachel, I want to uh, at least continue this conversation about not providing site-specific information because in some ways I think we're avoiding the hard truth. That's exactly what we need to be providing, not only to markets but to homeowners. So I appreciate that you didn't do it. We haven't done it on the work that we're doing, but we are moving in that direction. And I ultimately think if we're going to be serious about sort of the risk and the vulnerability, we need to share this with communities. So I'm wondering, moving forward, do you see doing this, even though it puts the individual property owner in a – Tough position. So we absolutely have shared this with communities. The zip code is, is you know, fairly fine-grained, but we have also gone into communities at their invitation and have shared data with them privately that we have not put out publicly when we are invited in and when we're asked about. So, And then oftentimes the question is, and will this seawall protect us or will this – and we, we've answered those hard questions, too, about the time limitations around some of these adaptation measures. People tend to think that they have, it'll buy them unlimited time, but oftentimes it's, it's going to buy you a little time. Use it wisely, because this is not the end strategy. This is not the end game strategy. And it highlights the distinction between being methodologically and actuarially sound as well. Uh, please. Hi. Uh, my question is for uh, Marco and, and Linda. So, Marco, you made a, a point about how some of the new, new builds in uh, North Carolina were in areas that were particularly vulnerable. And then Linda made the point about this kind of perverse economic percentage, uh, incentives because you have um, these tax bases that need to be built up by having um, income from these kinds of things. So how um, – should, should do we have governmental mechanisms uh, for zoning uh, for, for, of increased density or for new builds? 
and how can we av avoid this pitfall of, of uh, building things that are mo more vulnerable uh, because of the short-term tax benefits? Thank you, Olivia. Um, I don't think I have an answer to that. Uh, my, my point would be more uh, to also connect with the discussion about the property value data that I think there should be the first step would be, as I mentioned, a full disclosure of data. There is still very, it's still very hard, even for experts, even when you have access to the data set, and we do have access to the Zillow uh, one by one property data set. We do have access to the Atom data set. Uh, so one simple paper, if we were in academia, uh, would be to compare those two data sets. Uh, but I cannot even imagine the repercussions. I'm thinking about how much, how quickly I want to destroy my career. Uh, but in order, my point would be, it is very important to have access to uh, better uh, quality controlled uh, and uh, data sets for this kind of estimates to reduce the error bars and uncertainties that we need to make the decisions. I do agree that I think uh, working at a uh, house by house level is uh, a way to go because uh, that creates, uh, that information can create knowledge that can be used for making decisions, which I think it does not happen. I, and I'm not complaining about the, the I think uh, UCS does an amazing job, but I would not be able, to, for example, to, to look at the distance from uh, the primary body waters if I had the zip code level data set. So I'm not sure about uh, that, but I, I do think that insurance companies and uh, commercial companies are working on this should all uh, promote a discussion about what is the next incentive that people are gonna get, because this is another point of insurance. There is no incentive here. It's a completely different model of, of insurance, and that is also what's driving the stagnant situation here. Uh, Linda, please, then Phil. Okay, so I think the, the data, I am not sure how clear the data really impacts people. It, Deborah Javelin's shown in North Carolina, the county that gets hit the most with hurricanes. Most of the homeowners there have done nothing to protect their houses, and the information signal is pretty clear uh, over the past decade. So I don't, I don't know. And if you look to surging seas, you can find your house, translating it in terms of depth, the frequency, that's just an added level of specificity but the data itself is available if people believe it, and yet many studies show that after more storms, people that don't believe climate change continue to not believe climate change. This is just weather, so I wanna put that out there. But to your question, I think that um, there are certainly changes that we can make in building practices and upzoning and changes to zoning, and this whole move with many cities questioning single family house zoning provides new opportunities and spaces to discuss that. But the reality also is that a lot of our metropolitan regions, every metropolitan region in this country is about 100 municipalities. And that means every municipality tends to be really small. So for many coastal municipalities, there is nowhere else that you can realistically move to. And so that presents a challenge unless you start changing or realigning or merging where pooled resources, pooled new densification can actually benefit multiple municipalities. And on that point, I think there are lots of places that could have more investment and, um, and, and going up. A lot of them tend to be in um, places that are communities of color. So the real thing we want is for those people, for, for not those people, but for communities of color to, who have suffered disinvestment to benefit from the reconstruction process, not to be displaced from it. And so how do we, posit this not as we're gonna be kicked out and white people are gonna move in, but how do we have a stake and ownership in this? And I think that's a broader question around property rights regimes that we have in this country that needs to change. Great, well listen, we're bleeding into lunchtime. Thank you all for your patience and thank you for attending today and thank you to our panelists.